Manuel, you can start. Can you give me... Okay, let me just see if I can... Uh... here I will connect my own laptop here to see you guys let's see okay join without video uh, join with computer audio but I will put on mute Now I can see you, I guess. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Yes. How are you guys doing? Okay. Walter, are we okay? Can we start? Yes, we can start. All right. So welcome back, everyone. This is uh, Rio Analysis class number two. I hope you all had a good break in these two days. Anything you wanted to add regarding our first lecture? Was that okay? I'm looking at your faces now. Was that okay? Was it too hard, too easy? Should we go faster, slower, or should we keep going the way that we are? It's okay. It's okay. Good. Does anybody disagree? Hell, I cannot hear you. Have you ever seen that movie called The Truman Show? Yes. This is uh, a very nice Jim movie. Curry movie. Yeah, this is how I feel now. I'm just talking to a camera. I'm talking to a sound that I don't know where it comes from. You know, this is very interesting, very annoying Hello. feeling. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Ruba. Okay. Um, I, I, uh, I want to suggest maybe going faster if everyone has a already background on measure theory. Uh, you wanted to propose that we go faster. Yes, because I, I think um, most of us has a background in major theory already. Okay, don't, I mean, good to hear that. I would tell you not to worry. I think we're going, we're going to get to pretty good places really soon. So don't worry about it. I think we're going to go, we are going to go on a, on a steady pace. I, I think you will be pleased. But still, if you, if you still think about going faster in two weeks, then we can uh, revis revisit the topic, okay? Just for the sake of completeness, I, you know, so the point I wanted to do here, I want to go maybe a little bit faster in this beginning of reviewing measure theory, but also I wanted to at least mention the highlights, you know? And this is the aim for the, the first classes. So this is, uh, let's say, real analysis. Uh, 2020. This is lecture two. And then we're going to talk today about measures and integration. Okay. Uh, so let me just uh, mention to you again uh, why I'm doing what I'm doing and, and what's the reason, I mean, what's the, my, the philosophy behind, you know? The, the, this course is, as the name suggests, is supposed to be real analysis. So we should be caring a little bit more about the Euclidean space and the analysis of functions and measures in the, in the Euclidean space. We are going to do this very soon, you know? I just wanted to start by reviewing these basic concepts in a more abstract way of, of measure theory and integration because I think this is simpler. And I just want, for each of the topics, just to give the basic definitions and some highlights and, uh, you know, point out to you what's more important. You know, there is a point where measure theory gets very complicated in the abstract way, and I don't want to go there. You know, because at that point, I want to, to go in the abstract sense for maybe two, three, four lectures. And then we're going to move quickly to define the Lebesgue measure and do the things that we want to do in the Euclidean space. Things will be more concrete. But up to there, I think uh, an abstract view on measure theory is actually simpler. It opens up your mind. Uh, it gives you some framework to work in different things in the future. Maybe you will not work 
exactly in real analysis. You want to do some things in probability. You want to do some things in dynamical systems. So this will all in, you know, include the subject of measure theory somehow, one way or another. Uh, and again, the point here is not, if you go and read any book, you know, any of the books that I put in the references for you in the last class, Follin's book, uh, Zygmunt's book, Stein's book, they are full of examples, you know, you can digest any of the concepts, take a look, several examples, several nice propositions, corollaries. I don't want to do this all here in the class because I think we can use our time uh, a bit more effectively. We just have 15 lectures. So what I want to do is for each topic that we discuss, I want to give you what I think are the highlights, you know. For example, you see, we are going to start perhaps seeing today this, this nice convergence theorems, right? Uh, and then you will go to books and they will, they will have many convergence theorems, but I wanted to highlight to you just three things, you know, monotone convergence, Fatou's lemma, and dominated convergence. So keep these three in mind, whatever you go in the future. You will see in books other types of convergence theorems. Yes, they are nice, they're important, but these three are the core ones. I mean, if you have to remember something, get these three with you. And, and I want to do this for each of the topics, you know, just say what, what I think is central in that topic. I don't want to teach you everything about all the topics. I want to perhaps mention what's more important, what I think is more important about each topic. And then at the end, at the end of this course, if you do what I tell you to do, you know, read on the books, study four or five hours a day, do all the homework, study with your friends, and, and, and really devote yourself for two months to learning this the best that you can, you will have a solid background in analysis and you will be capable to move to whatever you want to do after here, you know? This is my goal for you. All right, so in the last class, I wanted, uh, we, 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 we finished um, discussing uh, what, a, what a measure space, uh, what, a, what the sigma algebra was, and the measurable functions were, right? So we discussed in the, in the last class uh, the notion of a sigma algebra. Okay? Which is just a collection of, uh, of subsets of your initial Space, your initial set omega. So it's a collection, a collection of subsets which is closed under complements and under countable unions, right? And by these uh, basic uh, manipulations with sets, you know, it's actually closed to any reasonable set operation that you want to do, that you can do, you know? Not only under closed unions, but under closed under countable unions, but also closed under countable intersections. You can subtract sets and so on. So we define a sigma algebra in this sense, right? So you had the, the union of these guys would belong to the sigma algebra if each of these guys was there, right? But then you can say, well, I want to take, say, A and the complement too. So we define it with this, and if A belongs to my sigma algebra, sigma, the A complement, would belong to the sigma algebra too, right? So these are the two things that define my sigma algebra. But then you say, well, say I wanted to take A minus B. So A minus B, if A and B are in my sigma algebra, of course the A minus B is, but how can I write A minus B with this set of axioms here? Well, A minus B would be A intersection, the B complement. But A intersection B complement would be A complement union B, say, complement, okay? So with these uh, set theory tricks, you know, and then here you're fine, because if A is in the sigma algebra, A complement is, B is, the union is, and the complement of the union is. Okay, so from now on, since you have done this once, you are okay to say that the difference of sets in the sigma algebra also is in the sigma algebra. Also, the, inter the countable intersection, as I told you. How would you write the countable intersection of sets? Well, I think you can take the countable union of the complements and take the complement. 
check if these things are correct. If not, just modify it until you find the right thing. You know? So from now on, countable intersections is also allowed. So you, you do this thing once. So this is, as I told you, it's like a game, right? I am just going to give you a set of axioms, a set of rules of the game. And you will be able, so these are the first tools that you have. It's like I'm giving you just two, two tools. And you are going to develop other tools. And once you develop these, these are in your pocket for you to use from that moment on. OK, so I know how to prove that the difference of two sets is in my sigma algebra. Great, now you can start using it. I know how to prove that the intersection of sets is in my sigma algebra. Great, now you can use it from now on. Well, prove these things at least once in your life. Once you proved, once you convinced yourself, then you can put in your pocket and use it for the rest of your life, OK? Because it follows from the basic uh, axioms, the basic rules of the game. All right. So the sets in the sigma algebra, we have seen some examples of sigma algebras. You know, you can take the collection of all the subsets. This is not very interesting. You can take just the empty set and the whole set. This is not very interesting too. And then we've seen that there is a notion to construct the smallest sigma algebra that contains any given collection of subsets that you want. That starts to be interesting. You know, the smallest sigma algebra that contains the open sets in the Euclidean space is what we call the Borel sigma algebra. We will be talking more about this later. Uh, and then we started to define the measurable functions. And just let me recall you what the measurable function was. Well, my function here, remember, I'm taking a function from uh, my space. And either with the real values or, if you want, with extended real values, I'm, I can allow my function to take the value plus or minus infinity. And uh, I would say that my function is measurable when the pre-image of any interval is a measurable set. Belongs to my sigma algebra, right? So it's a measurable set. The sets in my sigma algebra, I call them measurable sets. So if the pre-image of any interval is in my sigma algebra, I call this function a measurable function. And we have seen in the last class that we don't actually have to check for all the possible intervals. We just can check for one type of interval, say, going from A to infinity. So if you want, you can say that the pre-image of the set where the f of x is bigger than a certain number A is measurable for all the possible real values of A. All right. So now let's, let's start today from this point. That we have a space. We have already a collection of sets in my sigma algebra. And I want to start measuring the sets. OK, so this is the first topic of today, measures. OK, I want to start measuring my sets in this sigma algebra. Well, and if you think about it, this notion comes from what the name suggests, you know? I want to measure. I want somehow to, to count. I want somehow to measure the volume, you know? So people started with this notion in the past. You know, they were actually trying to compute uh, lengths of, uh, of lines, areas of, uh, of things in the plane, volumes of things in the space. What are the shapes of things for which you can measure the volume and so on? So this is a notion that is behind the measure, you know? And if you think about the basic axiom that you have to have in mind, so suppose I want to measure a volume, a volume of water in a recipient here in the space. So one thing that you want to impose when you move to this more abstract framework is that if you have a certain volume here, and if you have a certain volume right there, far away, this joint, well, the measure or the volume of the two things should be the sum of the volumes of each of the separate things if they are disjoint, right? So you want this measure to add up when the pieces are disjoint. And of course, this makes sense. If we want to make a theory, if we want to make an abstract measure theory that uh, can be specialized to measuring volumes in the space, this is the thing that we have to ask. 
Okay? So let's go with the proper definition. I will start uh, with a set. Okay? So let uh, my omega and my sigma be fixed. So I have a set. I have a sigma algebra. So let this be what we called a measurable space. And uh, I will define, say, a function mu from sigma to 0 infinity. OK, so my function is going to go from the subsets in the sigma algebra, taking values from 0 to infinity, including the possibility of 0 and including the possibility from infinity. So this is the extended half line to the right. So a function like this is called a measure if the following properties hold. Let's see. First, mu of the empty set is 0. So let's adopt this convention. Uh, and this function mu is countably additive. U is countably additive. That is, you know, if the sets say a n and bigger or equal than one in your sigma algebra are disjoint, you will have that the measure of the union of these ANs will be equal to the sum of these measures of every single guy separately. Okay? This is a countable collection. So it could either be finite or you can take n from 1 to infinity. Okay? So keep this property in mind. This is the property that defines a measure. So any function that you can put in your sigma algebra that verifies these properties uh, is what we are going to call a measure. So it has to be countably additive. So if you get these joint pieces, the measure of the union has to be the sum of the measures of the, of the single parts. Professor. Right? Tell Professor. Me. Yes. First condition, first condition, how much important? Important, because uh, first condition implied by the second condition. Yes, the first condition here is, is just, really, it's not that important. It's just to say that you cannot define the measure of everybody to be infinity. So if you have, I mean, when you say that the first condition follows from the second, I agree with you that the measure of A union the empty set is equal to the measure of A plus the measure of the empty set. Uh, and there's, of course, A union the empty set is just A. So you get the measure of A is equal to the measure of A plus the measure of the empty set. You can conclude that the measure of the empty set is zero, provided that there exists a set A whose measure is finite. Yes, yes, I okay? understand. So, okay, so, okay. so in principle, if you don't put this condition here, one trivial measure would be where the measure of everybody is infinity. And what you want to avoid this case, okay? So you just, I mean, it's equivalent to have one set in the collection having finite measure. It's equivalent to have the, the well, this implies that the measure of the empty set is zero. Of course, you can still have the measure of the empty set being zero and the measure of all the other sets being infinity. But okay, you should not bother too much about it. It's just, let's just define it like this for now. I mean, this is, uh, yeah, this is going to be important when we develop integration, of course. If, if the empty set has an infinity measure, this will be a bit uh, awkward for integration. So let's just assume this for now. This is, uh, let's see if, let, let, let's go with this. It, it is important that it's there for now. OK, uh, examples. So, I mean, uh, 
Again, you can start playing with this. Uh, you, you can take, for example, the natural numbers, omega to be the natural numbers. There are several examples of measures that you can certainly describe. So if you take omega the natural numbers and the sigma algebra to be all the subsets of the natural numbers, you can define the measure of a, a subset A to be the number of elements of this set A. So let's just, just say here, number of elements. as the cardinality of A. Whenever I write this, I mean the number of elements. This defines a measure in the natural numbers, which is known as the counting measure. So this is what we call counting measure. This is going to count uh, how many elements a set has. Okay? Of course, the measure of some sets here may be infinity. There's no problem, OK? You can play, I mean, uh, you don't have to go to all the natural numbers. You can play with uh, very basic examples. So if you take your set omega to be, say, 1, 2, 3, that's OK. And then you, can, you want to construct a sigma algebra that contains, say, 1, 2, and uh, 1, 3. So if you want these guys to be in your sigma algebra, you quickly see that the, the sigma algebra that they generate would be the whole thing, right? Because 1 is there, 2 is there, and 1, 3 is there. So you can subtract 1, 3 from 1, and you get that the element 3 should be there. So then if 1, 2, and 3 are separately there in the sigma algebra, all unions are there, and you get the whole set of subsets of omega. So if it contains this 3, it will contain everybody. And you can just say, well, let me just baptize that the measure of 1 is 1, the measure of uh, 2 is 4, and the measure of this other set, uh, 1, 3, is, I don't know, 10. So you can just baptize this. Can you actually find the measures of the other sets? Well, you can, right? If the measure of 1 is 1, the measure of 2 is 4, measure of 1, 3 is 10, then you can kind of use that the measure of 1 plus the measure of 3 should be the measure of the set 1, 3. So this is the additivity of the measure. These sets are disjoint. You know that this measure of the set 1 is 1. The measure of this set is something you don't know yet. And the measure of the set is 10. So this means that the measure of the remaining set is going to be 9. Okay. Now, if you have the measure of the building blocks, you can just use the additivity to make all the measures of the other sets in your sigma algebra. In particular, the measure of the whole space here, the measure of the set 1, 2, 3 will be 1 plus 4 plus 9. 5 plus 9 is going to be 14. Okay, So you can play with these examples a little bit uh, to convince yourself of the definition. And the definition makes sense, and it works fine. Okay. So in particular, in particular, let me make here just a, a, a couple of remarks. Uh, if your set, if your whole set, so, so let's think about some basic remarks. So first, if a set A is contained in a set B, whenever I, whenever I don't mention anything, I'm always assuming that my sets belong to the sigma algebra. Okay, So if two sets in the sigma algebra are such that A is contained in B, then the measure of A is obviously less than or equal than the measure of B. It's OK, right? Just because you can write B as, you know, B minus A union A. These are disjoint. So I can say that the measure is additive here. And this is always a non-negative number. Okay? So the measure of this guy has to be bigger or equal than the measure of this guy. 
both of them could be infinity. That's OK. But the measure of A is always less than or equal than the measure of B. This is the first observation. If the sets are contained, one is contained in the other. Second observation, which is actually more of a definition, if, uh, I mean, you may have examples when uh, mu of the whole space is finite. If mu of the whole space is finite, you call this measure, you call this a finite measure. A finite measure. Okay? Well, technically speaking, if mu of the whole space is one, you would call this a probability measure. Which is essentially the same thing, because if the measure of my whole set is 100, I can just consider a second measure, which just takes the original one and divides by 100 everybody. So from any measure that is finite, I can just divide by the total mass or the total measure of the set and get the probability measure. Okay? So probability, if you want to do probability, like I said, this, this, this basic uh, introduction to measure theory is going to be important for analysis. It's going to be important for pro probability for dynamical systems. You know, if you, in particular, if you want to do probability in the future, you'll be working a lot with uh, measure theory on spaces that have a finite measure. So whenever I, from now on, whenever I mention, you know, blah, blah, blah is a probability measure, I'm just saying that the measure of the whole space is one. It's finite and it's one. Sometimes the whole space might have infinite measure, okay? So if mu of omega is, say, infinite, or, or maybe I should not say that the measure of the whole space is infinite. So let's say, but if my omega can be written as a union of ANs, let's say a countable union of ANs, with each measure of AN being finite, then this measure mu is called sigma finite. Okay, you say that a measure is sigma finite if your whole space can be covered with pieces that have finite measure. My infinity here looks a bit ugly, so let me do it again. This is the example of the RD, so the, the Euclidean space or the real line. The real line with the Lebesgue measure that we're going to see in a bit uh, has infinite measure, but you can cover the real line with balls of increasing radius, increasing radii, and then each ball has a finite measure, and the union of all of these things is the whole space. Okay, so this is the Euclidean space is a basic example of a sigma finite measure. Lebesgue measure is an example of a sigma finite measure. So, and as this, uh, as I was briefly mentioning in the introduction of this class today, the whole reason that we put this in an abstract framework, I mean, it would make no sense to put things in the abstract framework if we could not specialize this to actually measure what we want to measure in real life. Okay, and uh, in principle, this is uh, the object of the Lebesgue measure. So the Lebesgue measure would be, so we are going to discuss this in more detail, but for now, just believe me that there is a measure on the space, on the Euclidean space RD, okay, that, uh, you know, the sigma algebra is, is finer than the Borel sets, so the Lebesgue measurable sets are more than the Borel measurable sets, and this measure mu, you know, what you understand for a measure of a rectangle, for example, it is going to be preserved. You know, there is a, there is a measure here, so the sigma will be the, what we call the Lebesgue measurable sets, and this Lebesgue measurable sets would be something that contain the Borel 
measurable sets. So it's a larger collection of sets that we can measure. And the measures of these sets, the measure of, if you take a rectangle R saying uh, A1, B1, cross A2, B2, cross blah, 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 A, D, B, D, right? So it's just a product of intervals. So let me just draw here in two dimensions here. So here you would have an interval, here you would have another interval. So if this is uh, the interval A1, B1, the length of this interval is going to be B1 minus A1. So this is the length of this side. The length of this other side will be B2 minus A2. And uh, since you understand from the third grade, the area of a rectangle is just the product of the sides. And you want this to be preserved. So this measure will be preserved we preserve the intuition, right? So the measure of this set R will be just the product of the lengths of the sides, bi minus ai, i from 1 to d. And you can kind of morally imagine ourselves in a couple of classes from now playing the same game that we started to play here. I have a whole set. I have a sigma algebra. I complete my sigma algebra to see what's the smallest sigma algebra that contains this collection of sets that I wanted to start with. So I get the, the whole sigma algebra. I know how to measure some of these initial sets. And I want somehow to extend my measure to the whole sigma algebra like we did here. This is roughly the same game that we are going to play to define the Lebesgue measure, the Lebesgue measurable sets, and the Lebesgue measure. You know, we know that it will be something that contains the Borel algebra. So it will have to contain all the open sets and all the closed sets. In particular, it will contain these guys, right? And then you can start doing countable unions of these things, countable intersections, complements, and so on. And once you construct this, I'm going to tell you, well, OK, so now let's construct a measure on these sets. And you will start, well, what's the first thing that you know how to measure? You know how to measure lengths of intervals if you are in one dimension. If you are in two dimensions, you know how to measure the area of rectangle. If you are in three dimensions, you know how to measure areas of cubes and parallelepipeds. You know, you know how to measure the areas of, uh, let's say, generalized rectangles, you know, rectangles in D dimensions. OK, so I know how to measure these guys. I want my measure to, to, to have this property. So you will start defining your measure on the collection of rectangles and their disjoint unions. And then just by taking disjoint unions of rectangles, you start to cover very crazy shapes. You know, you can take a shape like this and you can start covering it by, by rectangles, you know, in some nice way. You take this and then you cover by rectangles, blah, blah, blah. So some sets can be filled in with some rectangles in a countable union. And then you will define the measure of the set. You will use the axiom of the measure. It will be just the sum of the measures of the rectangles inside. But then you have to ask yourself the question, well, this is not properly well defined. I can certainly take one crazy set, cover inside with rectangles, and get a sum of the measures. That's OK. But what if I covered in a different way with some other rectangles? Wouldn't I find a different answer who knows? We have to prove that not. We have to prove that no matter how you cover a set, one of these sets with rectangles from inside, when you sum up, you always get the same number. And voila, that is going to be the measure of this set. You know? Uh, more about this to come. But if you want just for now to believe that there is a measure on the real line or on the Euclidean space RD, such that the measure of the interval in the real line, it is, it is what it should be. The measure of a rectangle in R2, it's what it should be. The measure of the, the area of the circle, the area of the rectangle, they are what you always learn that they, are, they were, you know, in plain geometry. The area of the rectangle, the area of the circle, the area of the triangle, they keep being what they are. So we're not going to change that. So just believe for a moment that there is a measure that does this. And in a few classes, I will 
we will go to the formal construction of this thing, which is very beautiful. Many people go in a course in measure theory without actually, without actually properly defining the Lebesgue measure. They, they just take, okay, let's just believe that this is true. One day in your life you will see the construction and let's just move on and learn more things. That's also a valid approach. I mean, I could do that, but I won't. I will actually spend a couple of classes to properly define this object. Questions for now? No um, question. Go uh, ahead. Is, is it possible for every sigma algebra we can assign a measure? Tell me again. I don't think I understood. Uh, is it for all sigma algebra we can assign a measure on it? Okay, so is it possible that in all sigma algebras to assign a measure to it? The answer is yes. I mean, you can just put the measure of the empty set to be zero and the measure of all the other sets to be infinity. So it's not very interesting, but in principle, it's possible. Now, maybe the question is, question should be, is it possible that in all sigma algebras I put some sort of interesting measure on it? And then, yeah, you would have to think about a little bit. Uh, If I just uh, disregard this example that I gave you, of course, you can just say that the measure of everybody is also zero. That's another measure. It's also not so interesting. Um, yes, but th th this is, uh, there are many ways to construct many measures. If I, if I okay, so just to answer your question. So if I, if I give you a set and I give you a measure, if I give you a sigma algebra, you can, you can always construct a measure on the sigma algebra. For example, I just gave you two, right? Uh, first one, the measure of all the set sets in the sigma algebra is zero. This is not very interesting. Another one, the measure of the empty set is zero and the measure of all the other sets is infinity. This is also not very interesting, but you can construct others. For example, uh, just take uh, fix an element. So one example here. You may, you may fix an element, say, little a, belonging to your set. Dirac measures. Yes, Dirac so measure. you, you can take a delta measure or Dirac measure, and then you say that the measure of the set A is going to be either one, if uh, your set, your element A is in the set A, or it's going to be zero otherwise. So the sets that contain your, your original element will have measure one, and if it does not contain your original element A, will have measure zero. This, you can prove that this is a measure. Sometimes it's called the Dirac measure with a mass in A. This is actually a probability measure. Okay, so this is the, the, perhaps the simplest example of a probability measure. The measure of the whole space, of course, is one. Um, professor. Go ahead. Um, is there any canonical way to um, somehow extend a measure on one sigma algebra to a larger sigma algebra? So for instance, say um, uh, we have a sigma algebra of uh, Lebesgue measurable sets and we have a larger sigma algebra. Is there a canonical way to extend the Lebesgue uh, measure to that larger sigma algebra? Well, is that even possible? Uh, let's see. I w <laughs> um, it is not always possible. It's not always possible. Uh, for example, the Lebesgue measure, we will see, it's invariant under translations. If you are in the real line, the Lebesgue measure is going to be invariant under translations. So this is the first question. This is the second question, right? So, uh, so the Lebesgue measure, if you are on the real line, and uh, with the Lebesgue measure, Uh, 
you will have that the measure of, say, a number A plus an interval or, or a set is going to be the measure of the set. Okay, so if you just take your set and you translate, you get uh, the same measure. Okay, so this is translation invariant. And, and, and if you are in RD, actually the measure of the rotation of a set is the same measure of a set. Uh, so this is, uh, this is, these are two properties that the Lebesgue measure has. But, but just focus on the first measure, first property, you know, translate. So you want a measure on the real line such that if your set A is here and you translate to, you, you add up a little number, little A, and you put the set A plus little A right here. These sets here should have the same measure, and they will have the same measure, right? This is very reasonable. If you just take a volume here and you move it, the volume right here, this will have the same measure. The Lebesgue measure will do that. When, when, a is the, when A is a measurable set. Now, if you were to extend this measure to a measure on the whole line with the same property, you can actually prove, and I think we're going to prove this, that there is no measure, there is no measure in the, in the whole in, the sub, in, the, in all the subsets of R, let's say the sigma algebra formed by all the possible subsets of R, there is no translation invariant measure on the whole subsets of R. Okay? Maybe you can think about this as a very constructive exercise to prove that there is no translation invariant measure on the whole set of subsets of R. So this means that if... Uh, Kind of, I don't know if I understood your question correctly, but if you wanted to take the Lebesgue measure on the Lebesgue measurable sets on the sigma algebra and you wanted to extend, keeping this translation invariant property, for example, to the whole sigma algebra of subsets of R, you would not be able to do that. But in some cases, you can actually take a measure and, and enlarge your sigma algebra a little bit and enlarge, I mean, and extend the measure to a measure in the new sigma algebra. I'll have to think about a little bit, I don't remember necessary and sufficient conditions when this is or this is not possible, but uh, my initial feeling is that uh, it's not always possible. And by the way, uh, you are of course free to ask me uh, as many questions as you want. Uh, as you'll see, I might not always have the answers. Probably I won't have the answers and I will not be any how embarrassed, embarrassed to say to you that I don't know, okay? I actually think that uh, you all should practice a little bit of this too in your life going in the future, you know? To me, one of the most important phrases that one learns in mathematics is, I don't know. I find it beautiful when I ask something to the student and the student replies to me, I don't know. I will think about it, I will read, and maybe I will know. This is awesome. You know, uh, and I try to exercise this whenever I don't know something. Too. Okay, so let's let's. Uh, I might talk a little bit more about this when we discussed when we discuss homeworks in in a minute. Are we okay for now? Can we move on? Okay. Yeah, we're okay. Let's let's move on for a little bit. Ah, okay. So maybe. I wanted to discuss with you this, uh, this exercise or this proposition. I am actually assigning to you as an exercise in your homeworks. But let's just discuss this here because it's so beautiful, so, so important. Two, two interesting properties that you should uh, remember. One, uh, let's see. If you have a sequence of sets, a n, n bigger or equal than 1, that are all measurable, so they're all contained in the sigma algebra. And this is an increasing sequence, so a1 is contained in a2, which is contained in a3, so on. So it's an we call this an increasing sequence of subsets. Then the measure of the union of the ANs
let's say, onto infinity, let's just put infinity. It's just equal to the limit when n goes to infinity of the measure of the ans. Okay. Let's skip this. And the second one, if now you have the contrary relation, so if A1 contains A2, contains A3, and so on, and the measure of the first guy is less than infinity, then you have that the measure of the intersection of the ANs when n goes to 1 to infinity is equal to the limit when n goes infinity of the measures of the ANs. You will sometimes hear some uh, uh, references to these results with other names. So this is closely related to what it's called the borel cantelli lemma. Uh, but this is, these are two very interesting and, and important exercises that I want to discuss with you. Uh, if you have an increasing sequence of sets, the measure of the union is just the limit of the measures of these guys. If you have a decreasing sequence of sets, and the measure of the first one is finite. It doesn't have to be the first one. If the measure of the, the tenth guy or the one hundredth guy, if the measure of some guy is finite, then the measure of the intersection of all of them is the limit of the measures of these guys. Let's take a look. Let's think about together how we would approach the solution of, of a problem like this. And now let you to fill in the details and write up the solution in your homework. So remember, your measure, remember, again, this is one in instance of the game that we're playing. I gave you the axioms of what a measure is. We are going to prove this using just the definition of the measure. So the measure is countably additive. Whenever I have this joint, a countable union of these joint sets, I can add up the measure. Once I prove these things, they will be new tools that I have to use for the future. Okay? So we are going to be playing this sequence of logical steps here all the time. Okay? So you have to be very conscious, you know, very aware that the things follow a logical chain. I give you a definition, let's prove some properties from the definition, and then these properties become tools that I can use to prove other properties, and then other properties, and then so on. And then everything we'll be able to discuss freely once we have established all the properties. But there are some things that you cannot prove unless you prove things before. So you have to be a bit careful in what with the order that you do things. It matters a little bit, OK? It actually matters a lot. But uh, so be sure that you are, from the definition, you can go to these things. And from these things, you can go to other things. So be sure that you have these steps in mind when you do uh, this course. So let's, let's take a look at how we would solve this, this, this proposition. Proof. Uh, So for the first one, you have a set of sets that one is contained in the next one. So you have, you have here A1, you have here A2, you have here A3, and so on. They are obviously not disjoint because one is contained in the next one. How you are going to use somehow the, the definition of measure? Well, to use the definition of the measure, you have to have these joint sets. So first, perhaps a basic idea here is to define new sets. We're kind of using number one. 
I'm going to define the set E1 as being A1. Then I'm going to define the set E2 as being A2 minus A1. So let's say A2 minus A1. So sometimes I use this notation to mean this set minus this set. If you are used to this notation A2 minus A1, that's also fine. Choose whatever you prefer. Okay? And then you can put E3 to be A3 minus A2, and so on. Right? So this would be my first set. Uh, let's see if I have colored chalk here. This would be my second one. This would be my third one, and so on. What am I, what I am doing now is to make, making them disjoint. Okay? So with these definitions, blah, 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 you, just, you can notice that the union of the ENs over N is just the same union of the ANs over N. Well, let's just check that. Well, if a guy is in one of the AN, if a guy is on the right side, if an element X is on the right-hand side, then it belongs to one guy, AN. Then if it belongs to AN, it must belong to one of the previous guys. Because notice from this definition here that, notice that uh, AN is actually E1 union E2 union EN. And this union is disjoint. Okay? So if a guy belongs here, it belongs to one of the guys. If it belongs to one of the guys, it must belong to one of these ENs before. So if, uh, if an X belongs to the right hand side, it automatically belongs to the left hand side. Conversely, if an element belongs to the union of ENs, then it must belong to one of these guys, say EN. Then if it belongs to EN, since EN is AN minus AN minus 1, it will belong to this AN. Hence, it will belong to the right-hand side. This is usually how you prove that two sets are the same. You know? Take an element on the right-hand side and prove that it's on the left-hand side. Then, conversely, start with an element on the left-hand side and prove that it's on the right-hand side. Therefore, the sets are the same. So these two sets are the same. Uh, but then you know that the measure of the union of ENs uh, which is the measure of the union of the ANs. You have already established that these two sets are equal. The advantage now is that the ENs are disjoint. Well, since the ENs are disjoint, the measure of the union of these guys is just the sum of the measures of them. Okay, sum of the measures of the ENs. Well, when I write the sum from one to infinity of some non-negative numbers, what I mean is always actually the limit when little big N goes to infinity of the partial sums, right? Little N from 1 to N of B of B of E N. Okay? Whenever I write the sum from 1 to infinity of some non-negative numbers, what I mean is just the limit of the partial sums. And, and from this uh, relation here, star, that the an is just the disjoint union of these e guys from 1 up to n, the sum of the measures of these guys is just, so here I'm using star, is just the limit, limit I will repeat. The sum of these measures is just the measure of the union of the first big n guys, which is just my an. So, and this completes the first part, right? So the measure of the union, it's just the limit of the measures of these guys. Okay, so this is an example how we, you would you do a proof just using your definition. Now you have done this, this works, you have convinced yourself. From now on, you're free to use this whenever it appears in front of you because you have proved it. Is that clear? You fill in the details and write down your own version of this in your homework, okay? Number two. Number two is perhaps a little bit more subtle. Let's think about it together. What's, how would we do? Do, 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 do? I need chalk. Number two now is a different, is a different uh, thing. So, now, so let's say just you have here A1, you have here A2 inside, you have here 
A3 inside, and you go, you, you go inside. Huh, what can we do here? Well, we can. Tell me, go ahead. Okay, okay. Go ahead. We can J in as A1 minus AN. A1 minus minus AN. A1 minus AN. Yes. That's good. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, so let's just define EN to be A1 minus AN. And let's just put this for n bigger or equal than 2. That's fine. So let's just define this as the ANs. So what do you know about these ANs? Or you can even put uh, n bigger or equal than 1. That's fine. So the E1 is 0. So, so with this definition, you're telling me that the E1 is going to be contained in E2, right? It's going to be contained in E3, and so on. That clear? Because this, this piece here is A1 minus A2 is E2. This whole thing, A1 minus E3 is E3. So every time you subtract something smaller, A1 minus this is, is, it becomes an increase in sequence. That is great. Now, from the previous part, you get that, well, then the measure of the unions of these ENs is just the limits of, when n goes to infinity, of the measures of the ENs. Let's think about what's the union of these guys. I claimed, so let's keep this in mind. And the claim that you have to verify is that the union of these ENs, let's say n from 1 to infinity, you take a1, so you see in the, right in the middle, there is the intersection of everybody. So let's just call, let's just call this, this intersection of all the ANs to be the set X. So here it would be X. And I claim to you that the union of all of these ENs is perhaps it's reasonable to say that this is going to be A1 minus X. Can you prove that? Well, let's see. Let's again argue as we did De before. De Morgan law. De Morgan law. Huh? De Morgan law. De Morgan law. We use here. Union of ANs. Let's see. This is wrong, you say? No, no. For proving, we use De Morgan laws. De Morgan's law. Yes. I yeah. The audio here is sometimes is very bad, so I cannot understand. I cannot understand very well what you guys are saying. But let, let me just convince myself that this is the case, right? So, so the union of these guys. If if an element is on this side, then it belongs to one of the guys. Belongs to the to one en, then if it belongs to one en, that's because it belongs to A1 and does not belong to AN. So if it belongs to A1 and does not belong to AN, it belongs to A1 and does not belong to the intersection of all of them, which is a subset of AN. That's fine. So an element on this side is on this side. Now, on the other hand, let me take an element which is on A1 and not in the intersection. Uh, okay, so if this element is in A1 and not in the intersection, what we should do is, uh, 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 it will exist in some AN. If it's in A1, and then, then you're subtracting the intersection of all of these guys, right? A1 minus the intersection. This is a bit. Uh, give me one second. Then I want, to prove, I want to prove that it's in one of these guys, right? Okay, suppose. 
this fact implied by De Morgan law. De Morgan. Yeah. We have A1 minus the intersection is A1 intersection, the complementary of all intersection. Yes, you can use that. So it's the, this is A1. Intersection, the complementary of uh, everything. Intersection, the complement of the union. It becomes the union when you add the complement. The union of these guys, is that it? Yeah, so now we can distribute them, yeah, distribute the intersection on the union. And this will be just the intersection of the? A1 union. It will be the union of uh, A1 intersection AL. And the union only first. Let's see. You claim that's true, yes. Yeah, uh, complementary, uh, A and complementary. Yes. Da, 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 da. Yes, that's correct. I agree. Okay, very good. So once you write like this, uh, once you write like this, so A1 minus this guy is A1 intersection, the complement, the complement of this set. And the complement of the set is union of the complements of this guy. Yes. And uh, you claim that this is equal to the, now, intersection of two guys. It's just the union. Uh, well, yeah, okay, union of A1 intersection, all of these guys. Yes. Yes. Okay. So if you write it like this, what you get is, uh, if, a, if an element is on this side, then it has to be, in a member of this union, right? It has to be on a member of this union. And uh, this is exactly, well, A1 intersect AN complement is just union of A1 minus AN, right? So in other words, you're just essentially proving what I wanted to prove with the, with the manipulations of set theory, which is fine, okay? All right. That's... It's a clever solution from you guys. Uh, and once you know this, once you know this check mark, you can use, you can use what you learned from the first item, right? You can use what you learned here, uh, which is that uh, the limit of, well, the measure of this union of ENs is just the limit when n goes to infinity of the uh, ah, blah, of the measures of the ENs. Now, what you get here is that this is the measure of A1 minus X. Okay? And here you get the measure of EN, it's just the limit when N goes to infinity of. En is just A1 minus An. So this is just the measure of A1 minus A. Okay, so now it comes the point. Now it comes the point to use this hypothesis that the measure of one of the sets is finite. Okay. Because then you can use that the measure of you know, uh, A1 is just equal to the measure of A1 minus somebody plus this measure of somebody, okay? And this, uh, any subset of it, you know, any y, or any y contained in A1. This is true. If this is a finite number, then both of these are subsets of these guys. Both of these are finite numbers. Then you come from here. So this, this left-hand side will be just the measure of a1 minus the measure of x. You just move this measure to this guy. And the right-hand side will be a limit. Well, will be a limit of measure of A1 minus measure of An. Measure of A1 is just a fixed number. So you're taking the limit of a fixed number minus a sequence. So this guy may come out of the limit, and then you will be done, right? So measure of A1 minus measure of x. It's just measure of A1 
minus the limit when n goes to infinity of measure of a n. This cancels because this is a number, and you get your result. OK? This is slightly more subtle, but still, you think about it for a few minutes, and you can figure it out. Uh, is that OK? So we get, yeah. what we, we get what we wanted, right? The measure of the intersection is the limit of the measures of the set. So we now have proved these two things. We now are free to use this at our will, OK? I gave a sketch of the proof here. You complete the details if there is anything missing, if there is anything I did wrong. By the way, if I am ever teaching you, if I ever do something wrong, please point me out and, and we will correct together, OK? Don't uh, trust uh, blindly everything that I write. I'm, I'm, I'm susceptible to mistakes as everyone. So if you notice some, some typo, something wrong, just, just let me know. I believe we are OK. So from now on, as I told you, we have these two results to rely on. Now, wh why is this important, everyone? So can you think, can you, I mean, uh, whenever you see a theorem in mathematics, whenever someone proposes to you a result, uh, you should always take a look at the hypothesis. Why is this person assuming this? You should always challenge those hypotheses. Is this really required? So if somebody is presenting this result to you, if this happens and this happens, then the conclusion is true. Well, why is this necessary? That the measure we can of we can counterexample for this. Yeah. We can construct a uh, counterexample in a real line. How would you give a counterexample for that? We get intervals from n to infinity. Yes, very good. So if that is not the case, so there are counterexamples, right? And the counterexample is very simple. Yeah, so so you, can, you can take a look at these counterexamples. Ah, right, so if, if you just took, say, a n to be the interval, suppose you are in the real line, and this is just the interval from n to infinity. OK? And then you see that uh, a1 is contains A2, contains A3, and so on. But, and this is a big but, the intersection of all the ANs is the empty set. Okay, So the, the, the conclusion of that result does not work. Because the measures of all of these guys is infinity. The limit, of course, is going to be infinity. And the measure of the intersection is the measure of the empty set, which we define to be 0. Okay. So you really need the hypothesis that if you have a decreasing chain of subsets to use this result, you really need the hypothesis that at least one guy in the chain will have finite measure. It doesn't have to be the first one. If it were the second one or the third one, you just, you just forget whoever comes before and start working from that guy towards your proof. All right. And this is, this, these are measures, everyone. This is just a little bit of what I wanted to tell you about measures. Let us move on in our brief review of measure theory. Again, I cannot emphasize this enough. Uh, what I am going to do here is just a brief review, a brief outline of the whole theory. You should go to your favorite book. Books have lots of examples, lots of propositions, lots of corollaries, lots of little exercises. Go to your book, take a look, see lots of examples, see lots of possible ramifications and manipulations of the results. Spend some time reading it to absorb the concepts, to absorb the, the techniques. We have defined what is a sigma algebra, the measurable functions, and a measure. Now I want to move on and define what integration is. Okay? Number two, integration. Now I want to integrate functions on my, with respect to a certain measure. So from now on, I will say let let us fix omega 
a set, sigma a sigma algebra, and mu a measure on this sigma algebra. So this is, let this as before, as we defined before, right? So this is called a measure space. So whenever somebody comes to you and says, well, consider a measure space. A measure space is nothing more than a set, a sigma algebra, and a measure on this sigma algebra. So this is a measure space. Uh, I want, so our objective would be to define and study, properly define and study the properties of the following object. I want to define the integral of a function f with respect to this measure, d mu, over the set omega. So this is going to be my notation. Integral of the function f over the set omega with respect to the measure, d mu. This is implicit here in the notation that there is a sigma algebra. So this will be the notation for us. Sometimes you will choose the notation, other variations. So variations of the notation are always possible here. It doesn't matter if you want to call the integral over omega of f of x d mu of x, you can. If you just want to call integral of f d mu, you can. If you just want to call integral of f, you can. So you can do all possibles of notations, provided that the, it's clear from the context what you mean, OK? Again, the context should be, we should always have a set, a sigma algebra, and a measure, and you want to integrate functions with respect to that uh, setup. Again, it's not going to be all the functions that will be integrable, right? Given this, we have defined the set of measurable functions. As the name suggests, the sets, the, the measurable functions are the functions that we are going to try to integrate, to measure their size. Okay, so I will restrict ourselves to, this, to the set of measurable functions. So let's, let us uh, baptize, let us baptize the set of measurable functions f from omega to, and let's just, for simplicity, let's just assume that our functions can take the value plus and minus infinity as, let's baptize this as uh, m. And my m is looking like a mu, so let's just call this m. m for measurable functions. Okay? So these are the functions that I will try to, we will try to integrate. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we are going to try to integrate first the functions that are non-negative, okay? So let's say if in parallel with this definition, let me call the measurable functions from omega to zero infinity, including infinity, as let, let me call this m uh, plus, okay? So I want to, to talk about the non-negative measurable functions. Okay, so first, we are going to try to integrate the non-negative measurable functions. So I'm already giving up a little bit, try to integrate all the functions, I'm moving to the non-negative functions first. And even within the non-negative functions, I have to think about what the intuition tells me. So a theory of integration should, this, this whole theory was developed by Lebesgue in the beginning of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, like 1906, uh, as a generalization of the theory of integration by Riemann, right? So everything that this should be Lebesgue integrable should integrate what came before, okay? And so the, the, the <sighs> intuition tells me that if I have a function, and let's just put ourselves in the real line here, that I have a certain interval and my function is this value in this interval, and then in the second interval my function is this value, 
And in this third interval, say a1, a2, a3, a4, my function is this value, right? So you have seen, when you first learn integration or calculus, that the integral of this function over this piece should be the area below the graph. This, this, should be this, right? So the intuition comes from area below the graph. And I want somehow to extend this concept, right? So here, you have one value of the function. Let's call this value here, I don't know, uh, y, y1. Let's call this value here y2. And let's call this value here y3, OK? So you're, or, or, or even, uh, yeah. So, so the integral here, the integral of f, whatever it is, would, would be just the area below the graph. So the height of the rectangle times the, be the height times the base plus, and then here y2, and then a3 minus a2, and then plus the value y3 plus a4 minus a3. You just add up the areas of the rectangle as well. Now, what are the guys here? These guys are the values of the function f. Okay? And these guys here, this, this, and this, these are the lengths of intervals. Right? So what you want is to multiply the values of your function f by the lengths of the intervals. Well, we have already done a parallel between lengths of the interval and what we are trying to accomplish with our measure. The measure should be the, the thing that generalizes the length of the interval or the, or the area of the surface or the volume of, of the three-dimensional shape. And then here is the value of your function f that you are no, investigating now. So the thing is, in accordance to what the intuition tells me, the first thing that I should try to integrate is what we call a simple function. Okay? So from now on, whenever I tell you the expression simple function, you should just understand this as a linear combination of characteristic functions of sets, okay? So, a function of the type f sum of aj characteristic functions of sets aj, j from 1 to n, okay, is called a simple function. Okay? So have this in mind. It is a finite linear combination with coefficients of characteristic functions of, of measurable sets. Okay? So here, okay. It's important to mention that, of course, my sets AJ are measurable sets, okay? And these coefficients AJ, they are either real or complex. Depending if you, I mean, most of the things that we are going to do this, I will just take real valued functions. And uh, whenever you want to work with complex valued functions, you will just do what we did in the real part and in the imaginary part, okay? But if you wanted, you can put the coefficients here to be complex. It doesn't matter, okay? Uh, and my sets AJ are going to be measurable sets. These coefficients are not infinity, okay? So whenever I call simple function, I'm taking a linear combination of a finite number of characteristic functions of sets with coefficients which are real valued and not plus or minus infinity, okay? So this is what I mean by a simple function. 
Now, OK, so within this class, you will even restrict yourself to simple functions that are non-negative. OK, so let f be a simple function. Now, uh, I have to mention that uh, perhaps before I go, before, before I move on, maybe I should make a remark uh, saying that, well, it's perfectly OK if you have a function as a simple function and you have the coefficients to be the same. So you have, uh, say, if, if your function is, say, 1 in this set here and then 1 in this other set here, you can write your function 1 times the set a1. This is a1. And, and of course, 1 times the set a2. That's fine. Of course, you can also write it as 1 and then the characteristic function of the set a1 union a2. These are two ways of expressing the same characteristic function, the same simple function. Uh, so when I kind of group together the sets that have the same uh, value of the function, okay, so when uh, the aj's, my coefficients, are all different, okay, we will say, we will say that this uh, representation here is the standard, standard representation of f, okay? So y you may choose without loss of generality to put your simple function in this, in this standard representation, okay? To, to group together, if two, if two sets have the same value of AI, you can just take their union. So you can take the union of all the sets that have the same value. So you can assume without loss of generality that your coefficients are all, uh, are all different. Okay. Okay. Now, definition. So this now comes an important definition. Okay, so let f be a simple function. in this class, right, in, that, it, that is non-negative. I.e., that belongs to this class that we call M uh, plus. Consider a simple function that is non-negative, okay? So it's a function pretty much like the one I had here. So there are some sets in the base, and the function in this set is taking some values. So here in this set is taking this value, here in this set is taking this value, here in this set is taking this value. Has this representation where the coefficients a, j are bigger or equal than zero. Okay? So in other words, that is, the coefficients a, j are bigger or equal than zero in, uh, in star, in the, in the standard form. So we are going to define, let, let me call it phi for a moment, just to make a distinction between this f, a function of the type. Let me call it phi. Let me call it phi my, my simple functions. A function, let phi be a simple function that is non-negative. The first thing that we are going to do is we are going to define the integral of phi with respect to the measure d mu. And again, the notation, I'm probably using is like this, or some simplification, like this, or this, or like this, when the context, when it's clear from the context. So the simple function here, uh, the definition will be, I'm going to define this as what it should be. So this is going to be defined as the sum of. I think the camera is not moving. Okay. Camera. Please. It's okay now. 
going to define this as the sum from 1 to n of aj and then the measure of the set aj. I'm going to define it as it should be. You know, if I have a simple function, if I have a linear combination of three pieces, five pieces, ten pieces, a hundred pieces, I will just take the measure of each piece, multiply by the height, and I will add them up. So this will be the definition of the integral of a simple function. Just take the measure of the sets, multiply by the coefficient, which is the value that that function is assuming on that set, right? So remember that the characteristic function of a set is just one if the point belongs to the set and zero otherwise. So what's the value of this function phi on a particular set here? Well, phi at the point in the set aj is one times little aj, so it's little aj. This is the value of the function on the set, the common value of the function in the set times the measure of this guy. So this is the definition. And we come, ab we come back to the game again. I'm giving you a definition. Let's prove some properties about it, and let's see how far we can push this thing. So we started a few minutes late today. Let me go. I'm going to finish, wrap up sometime soon. I just want to finish the discussion here between, uh, finish the discussion on simple functions. Let me perhaps just an, uh, mention an exercise to you. We can do pa 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 pa. So well, basic properties. Um, let's see, pa pa pa. So, remark. Uh, if, if phi is a simple function, then, and uh, A is a set in your sigma algebra, this implies that uh, phi times the characteristic function of A is also simple. also a simple function. So what I'm trying to say is that if phi is just the sum of aj characteristic function of a, then uh, phi times the characteristic function of another set a is just the sum of aj times the characteristic function of aj intersection a. Okay, so you can intersect phi, your function phi, with a given set, which is different from the ones that are generating it. Okay, and uh, the notation that we shall use sometimes when I want to integrate a function phi, a simple function, in a certain set A, which is not the whole thing, this is just uh, going to be the integral of phi characteristic of A. Okay? This is a, a well-defined object. I'm, I'm defining the integral of a, of a simple function over the whole domain by that. So if I want to integrate a simple function over a, a smaller domain, I just multiply it by the characteristic function of this guy and, and, and look at this, okay? Okay, with this in mind, let me just uh, propose to you that you do at home the following exercise. So the definition is basic. I mean, you have just the simple functions. What you're just doing is kind of adding up areas. Simple functions are finite linear combinations. The coefficients are not plus or minus infinity. And you don't have to worry about uh, summing a plus infinity with a minus infinity. By the way, this is actually an interesting point here. We have to make this remark that for all purposes here, in this definition, zero times plus infinity is going to be defined to be zero, okay? So if I have a function that is taking the value zero in a set, in a big set, which might have measure infinity, I want the function that it's zero to always have integral zero, no matter how big is the set where it is supported, right? So it makes sense. So for, for all the purposes here, you could have this coefficient aj be zero. Well, it's not very meaningful in the definition. Of course, if the coefficient aj is zero, you could just drop that set 
from your characteristic function, from your simple function. But sometimes we'll be adding up simple functions. Uh, we're going to quickly move to positive and negative uh, signs. And when you add up simple functions, you might end up with some coefficients being zero. So it's better to already put in the definition the possibility of a coefficient being zero. But with this understanding, if you have zero multiplied by anything, possibly infinity, this is going to be treated as zero. Uh, so with this in hand, I want you to go home and solve the following exercise. Uh, so let phi and psi be simple functions, uh, be simple functions in measurable, then first things are very basic. So if c is a non-negative real number, the integral of c phi is going to be c times the integral of phi. c phi is obviously another simple function, so you're not leaving the class. The integral of phi plus psi, convince yourself that the sum of two simple functions is still a simple function. This is just going to be the integral of phi plus the integral of psi. So you can make it additive. This is very important. Okay? So the integral of the sum of two simple functions is just the sum of the integrals. If one function is less than or equal than the other, convince yourself that the integral of phi loses to the integral of psi. And four, the map that takes a set A and sends to the integral over A of phi mu, this map is a measure on the sigma algebra. This is a different measure. Okay? And this is particularly interesting. So the map, so if, if, if you give, a sim, give me a simple function, then the map now that sends any measurable set A to the integral of phi over that set A is a new measure on your sigma algebra, on your set. So you will go home and you will solve these four basic exercises from the definition of, of simple functions. And then in the next class, we are going to start by defining the integral for general, uh, general non-negative functions. Okay, let me just, so the class, let's say, ends here for today. I'm just giving you a, just a one minute preview of what's going to come next. Right? So as we do with the Riemann integral, when you have a function f, you kind of break it into some uh, intervals by below, say, and you try to add up the areas below by a partition, we are going to do the same here. So if, if my function f is a measurable function, still taking non-negative values, okay? I'm still always in the non-negative world. I haven't told you how to integrate functions with sign. Let's see, if my function is non-negative, what I'm going to do is I'm going to approximate this function by below, by simple functions, okay? And I'm going to define the integral of f, the mu. This is going to be the definition. The integral of f, the mu over my domain omega, this is going to be defined as the supremum over the integral of phi d mu over omega, where the supremum is taken, where the supremum is taken over all phi simple, all simple functions phi with the property that zero it's less than or equal than phi, so it's a non-negative simple function that loses to f. So the supremum of this right-hand side is going to be taken over all simple functions that are between 0 and f, that are below f. And this is going to be the definition of the integral of f. Okay? And with this definition, we're going to prove, start proving our properties. And this agrees with the, the Riemann philosophy from before, but we will see very quickly that we can integrate more functions with the setup. All right, so let me uh, conclude the class today. And uh, let's stop the recording today, and we meet again 
next Tuesday, okay? I assigned you some seven problems for homework for you guys to deliver next Tuesday. We are starting slowly. I want to, some of these we discussed today. So just sit down, take a look, write down your solutions for these seven problems. I wanted to start smoothly just to see. I, mean, I know that we are all adapting to this uh, tricky situation of the COVID and so on. So, but let's start. I hope that everybody will do everything and we're going to feel more motivated to do more and faster and, and more, more interesting stuff. But we continue again next Tuesday with the whole theory of integration. Next, we're going to come mo monotone convergence theorem, Fatou's lemma dominated convergence. I think that's the plan for next week. Maybe we're going to finish this soon and move to a bag measure. Thank you, everyone. See you next.